from the SiliconANGLE Media office in Boston, Massachusetts. It's the Cube. Now here's your host, Dave Vellante. Hi everybody, welcome to this special presentation in the Marlboro offices of the Cube. My name is Dave Vellante. And I'm here with a friend, a colleague, a mentor of mine, David Michella, who is a, an author and a fellow at the uh, Leading Edge Forum. Dave, thanks for coming in, it's great hey, to see great you. Great to see you again. So we're going to talk about your, your new book, Seeing Digital, a visual guide to industries, organizations, and careers of the 2020s. I got it here on my laptop, got it off of Amazon, so uh, you know, check it out. We're going to be unpacking what's in there today. This is your th third book. I believe, right? Yeah, Waves of power and, and uh, customer-driven IT. Customer-driven IT, which was kind of the 03 time frame coming out of the, the dot-com. And you know, to me, this is your most significant work. So congratulations on well, getting it done. I know how much work goes into it. You bet. So what was the motivation for writing this book? Well, it's a funny thing. When you, books are a lot of work, and you, during those times, you wind up asking yourself, why am I doing this? Because <laughs> they put in so much time. But you know, f for uh, the last, seven or eight years, our group, the Leading Edge Forum, we've been doing a lot of work mostly for large organizations. And our clients told us that the work we've been doing in consumerization and cloud and disruption and machine intelligence was really relevant to not just them, but to their wider audiences of their partners, their customers, their employees. And so people are asking, can we get this to a, a wider audience? Uh, and really that's what the book is trying to do. Yeah, you guys have done some, some great work. I know when I can get my hands on it, I, I, I consume it. For those of you who don't know, uh, Dave was originally came up with the theory of disintegration to kind of explain the shift from centralized uh, mainframe era to this sort of open, distributed competition along you know, different lines, uh, which really defined the, the Wintel era. So that was kind of your work really explaining industry shifts um, in a way that you know, help people and executives really understand that. Um, and then the nice thing about this book is, is you're kind of open sourcing a decade's worth of research that yourself and your colleagues have done. So talk about uh, the, the central premise of the book. I mean, we're entering a new era. We're sort of exiting the cloud web 2.0 era. We're still trying to figure out what to call this, but what's the central premise of the book? Yeah, the, the central premise is that th the technologies of the 2020s will indeed define a, a new era. And you know, the, the IT era industry just evolves. Uh, we had the mainframe era, the mini era, the PC era, the internet era, the mobility era, and now we're going to this era of, of intelligence and automation and blockchains and speech and things that are just an entire new layer of, of intelligence. And that that layer to us is actually the more powerful than any of the previous layers we've seen. If you think back, you know, the first web was founded around technologies like search and email and, uh, and surfing the web, quite simple technologies and created tremendous companies. And then the more the recently we had sort of the social era you know, for Facebook and, and, and Salesforce and all these companies that sort of took advantage of, of the cloud. But again, the technologies are, are relatively simple there. Now we're really looking at a whole wave of just fundamentally powerful technologies. So trying to anticipate what that's going to mean. So going from sort of private networks to sort of public networks to a cloud of, of remote services to now this set of interrelated digital services that are highly accessible and essentially ubiquitous is what you put forth in the book, right? Yeah, and, and we put a lot of emphasis on words. You know, why do words change? We had an internet that connected computers and a web that sort of connected pages and, and documents and, and URLs. And then we start talking about a cloud of stuff out there somewhere in, in, in cyberspace. But when we look at, at the world that's coming and we use those words, pervasive, embedded, aware, autonomous, you know, these aren't words that are really associated with a cloud. A and cloud is just a metaphor, that word. And so we're quite sure that at some point a different word will emerge because we've always had a different word for every era of change and, and we're going to one of those years now. So um, a lot of people have questions about, we go to these conferences and everybody talks about digital disruption and digital transformation and it's, it's kind of frankly lightweight a lot of times. It doesn't have a lot of substance to it. But you point out in the book that CEOs are asking the question, how do I get digital right? They understand that something's happening, something's changing, they don't want to get disrupted, but what are some of the questions that you get from some of your, your clients? 
Yeah, I, that, that first question, are we getting digital right, sort of leads to, to almost everything. Companies look at the way that a Netflix or Amazon operates and, and then they look at themselves and they see the vast difference there and they, they ask themselves, how can we be more like them? How can we be that fast, that innovative, that efficient, that level of, of simple, intuitive customer service? And one of the ways we try to define it for our clients is how do they become a digital first organization where their digital systems are their face to the marketplace? And most CEOs know that their own firm doesn't operate that way. And probably the most obvious way of seeing that is so many companies now feeling the need to appoint a, a chief digital officer because they need to give that task to someone. And CDOs are no panacea, but they speak to this need that so many companies feel now of, of really getting it right and, and having a, a leadership team in place that they have confidence in. And it's very hard work. And a lot of our clients, are, they still struggle with it. One of the other questions you asked in the book that is very relevant to our audience, given that we have a big presence in Silicon Valley, is can Silicon Valley pull off a dual disruption agenda uh, what do you mean by that? Yeah, I mean, if you look at the Valley historically, you, you could see them essentially as, as arms merchants. They were selling their products and services to whoever wanted to, to buy them, and, and companies would use them as they saw fit. But today, in addition to doing that, they're also, what we say is they're an invading army, and they are increasingly competing with the very customers they've traditionally supplied, and, and of course Amazon being perhaps the best example of that. So many companies dependent on AWS as a platform, but there's Amazon trying to go after them in, in healthcare or retail or grocery stores or, or whatever content business they're in. Content, every business under the sun. And, and so they're wearing these two dual disruptions hats. The technologies of our time are very disruptive, machine intelligence, blockchains, virtual reality, all these things have disruptive technology, but that second disruptive agenda of how do you sh change insurance, how do you change healthcare, how do you change the car industry, that's what we mean, those two different types of disruptions, that, and they're pursuing both at the same time. And because it's digital and it's data, that possibility now exists that a company, a technology company, can traverse industries which historically haven't been able to be penetrated, right? Uh, absolutely. There's, you know, in our view, every industry is going to be transformed by data one way or another. Whether it is disrupted or not is a second question, but the industry will be very different when all of these technologies come into play and the tech companies feel like they have the expertise uh, and, and the vision of it, but they also have the, the money and they're going to bet heavily to, to pursue these areas to, to continue their you know, growth agenda. So one of the other questions, of course, that IT people ask is what does it mean for my, for my job? And maybe we can, if we have time, we can talk about that. But you answer many of these questions with a conceptual framework that you call the matrix, which is very powerful, you said words matter, a very powerful concept. Explain the matrix. Okay, yeah. If we start, go back to this idea that every generation of technology has its own words, internet, web, cloud, and now we're going to a new era. So there will be a new word, and so we, use the word matrix as our view of that. And we chose it for two reasons. Obviously there's the movie, which had its machine intelligence and virtual worlds and, and, and all of that. But the real reason we chose it is that, it is this concept that a matrix, as in, as in matrix mathematics, is a structure that has rows and columns. And rows and, and columns is sort of the fundamental dynamic of, of what's going on in the tech sector today. That traditionally every industry had its own sort of vertical stack of, of capabilities that it did, and it was sort of top to bottom silo. But today, those horizontal platforms, you know, the PayPal's, the AWS's, the Facebook's, they, they run this, this Salesforce, they, all these horizontal services that cut across those firms. And so increasingly, every industry is leveraging a, a common digital infrastructure, and that tension between the traditional vertical stacks and these enormously powerful horizontal technology firms is really the uh, structural dynamic that's in play right now. And at the top of that matrix, you have this sort of intelligence and an automation layer, which mm. is this new layer. You don't, you don't like the term artificial intelligence. You make the point in the book, there's nothing really artificial about it. You use machine intelligence, but that's that, that top layer that you see powering the next decade. Absolutely, if you look at the vision that everybody tends to have, autonomous cars, 
personalized healthcare, blockchain-based accounting, mm -hmm. digital cash, uh, you know, virtual education, uh, brain implants for the media. Every one of those is essentially dependent on a layer of intelligence, automation, and data that is being built right now. And so just as previous layers of technology, you know, the web enabled a, a Google or an Amazon, the cloud enabled AWS or, or, or Salesforce, this new layer enables companies to pursue that next layer of capabilities out there to build that sort of intelligent societal infrastructure of, of the 2020s, which will be vastly different than, than where we are today. Will the adoption of the matrix, in your opinion, occur faster because essentially it's built on the internet and we we have the internet, i.e. faster than say the internet or maybe some other you know, major uh, innovations or is it yeah. going to take time yeah. for a lot of I, other reasons? I think the speed is actually a really interesting question because the technology of the 2020s are extremely powerful, but most of them are not going to be immediate hits. And if you look back, say, to search, you know, when search came out, it was very powerful and you could scale it massively quickly. You look at machine learning, you, you look at blockchain, you look at virtual realities, you look at algorithms, you know, all this speech in these areas, they're tremendously powerful, but you, there's no scenario where those things happen overnight. And so we d do not see an accelerating pace of change. In fact, in, in my view, people often overestimate the speed of change in our business uh, and consistently do that. But what we see is a sort of fundamental transformation over time, and that's why we put a lot of emphasis on the 2020s, because we do not see two years from now this stuff all being in place. And, and you have some good examples in the book, going back to you know, the early days of even, even telephony, so it's worth you know, checking that out. I want to talk about, bring it back to data, Amazon, Google, Apple, Microsoft, and Facebook, top five companies, um, public companies in terms of market cap. Actually, it's not true after the you know, Facebook you know, fake news thing. I mean, uh, Berkshire Hathaway is slightly it, it'll be back. Facebook, but <laughs> I agree, it'll, it'll be back. But the, the key point there is these companies are different. They've got data at their core. When you compare that to, to other companies, even, even financial services industry companies that ha are really data companies, but the data is very bespoke and it's in silos. Can, can those companies, those incumbent companies, can they, can they close that gap? Maybe you could talk about that a little bit. Yeah, we, we do a lot of work in the area of machine intelligence, artificial, whatever you want to call it. And one of the things you see immediately is this is a ridiculously large gap between what the, these leading companies do versus most traditional firms because of the talent, the data, the business model, all the things they have. So you have a, this widening gap there. And, and so the big question is, is that going to widen or is it going to continue? Will, will it narrow? And I think the, the scenario for it narrowing, I, I think, is a, a fairly good one. And the message we say to a lot of our clients is that you will wind up buying a lot more machine intelligence than you will build because these companies will bring it to you. Machine intelligence will be in AWS, it'll be in Azure, it'll be in Salesforce, it'll be in your devices, it'll be in the user interfaces, it'll be in the speech systems. So the supply side innovations that are happening in the giants will be sold to the incumbents. A and therefore there will be a, a natural improvement in today's situation where a lot of incumbents are sort of basically uh, trying to build their own stuff internally, and, and they're having some successes and, and some not, but it's, that's a harder challenge. But the supply side will bring intelligence to the market in a, in a quite powerful way fairly soon. Won't those incumbents, though, have to sort of reorganize in a way around those, those new innovations? I mean, given that they've got processes and procedures that are so you know, fossilized with their, with their existing businesses. A absolutely, and you know the word digital transformation is thrown around everywhere, but if it means anything, it is having an organization that is aligned with the way technology works. And a good example of that is, you know, if you, when you use Netflix today, you know, there's no separate sales experience, marketing experience, customer service, it's just one system, and you have one team that builds those systems. In a typical corporation, of course, you have the sales organization and the marketing organization and the IT organization and the customer service organization, and those silos is not the way to build these systems. So the message we send to our clients, if you really want to transform yourself, you have to have more of this team approach that is more like the way the tech players do it, and that these traditional boundaries essentially go away when you go in the digital world where the customer experience is all those same th at the same time. 
So if I'm hearing you correctly, it's sort of a natural progression of how they're going to be doing business and the services that they're going to be procuring, but there's probably other approaches. I mean, maybe it's forced, but you're seeing maybe M&A or you're seeing joint ventures. I mean, do you see those things as, as accelerating or precipitating the, the transformation or do you think it's, it's futile and it really has to be led from the top and at the core? It's, it's one of the toughest issues out there, and the reason people talk about transformation is because they see the need, but the difficulty is enormous. Uh, you know, most companies will say this is a three or four year process to make significant change, and, and this in a marketplace that changes every few months. So, you know, incumbent firms, uh, you know, they see where they want to go, but it, it's very hard, and, and this is why this whole thing of getting digital right is so important, that people need to commit to significant change programs, and, and we're seeing it. And uh, you know, my parent company, DXC, we do a lot of this with clients, and they want to embark on this program, and they need people who can help them do it. And, and so leading a transformation agenda in most firms is really what digital leadership is these days, mm -hmm. and who's capable of doing that, which requires tremendous skills and in, in soft skills and hard skills to do right. Let's talk about industries and industry disruption. Um, when you looked at the early I I disrupted industries, whether it was publishing, advertising, music, one maybe had the tendency to think it was a bits versus atoms thing, but you point out in the book it's really not the case. Um, because you look at taxis, uh, mm -hmm. you look at hotels, those are, you know, physical businesses, and they've been disrupted quite substantially. Maybe you could give us some thoughts and insight there, uh, particularly with regard to things like healthcare, financial yeah. services, which haven't been disrupted yeah. yet. And this is a huge part of the work that I've been doing for years. And, and as you say, if you look at the industries that actually have been disruptive, they're all relatively low security, low risk businesses. Music, uh, advertising, taxis, retail, uh, all these businesses have had tremendous changes, but the ones that haven't are all the ones where the stakes are higher. Banking, insurance, healthcare, aerospace, defense. You know, they've been hardly disrupted at all. And so you have this split between the low risk industries that have changed and the high risk ones that haven't. But what's interesting to me about that is that these technologies uh, of the 2020s are aimed almost directly at those high risk industries. So machine intelligence is aimed directly at, at healthcare, the autonomous systems is aimed directly at defense, and blockchains are, are aimed directly at, at banking and, and insurance. And so the technologies of the past, if you look at the internet and the web and the cloud areas, they were not aimed at these industries, but today's are. So you now have at least a highly plausible scenario where those industries might change too. When you talk to companies in those industries that haven't been disrupted, do you get a sense of complacency that, uh, well, we haven't been disrupted, um, we're going to wait and see? Sure. Or do you see a sense of urgency? Uh, no, the complacency is baked in for years of, of people saying, we've heard all this before, we're doing just fine. Uh, maybe it's their industry, but not ours. You don't buy it. Or, or, the, or the main one is, I'll be retired before, yeah, any, oh of the, before any of this <laughs> stuff matters yeah. for, the, for the senior execs. And the thing about all four of those is they're probably true. They have heard all this before because there was a lot of excessive hype. Many of them are doing just fine. Uh, you know, well, the one about the other industries is, is a wrong one, but and many of them will be retired before the, the things really bite, you know, executives in their, late in their career. So the, the inertia and the complacency is, is an enormous issue in, in most traditional companies. So let's do a little um, lightning round, if we can. Um, oh, actually, I just want to make a point. In, in the book, you lay out Disrupt, uh, di dis disruption scenarios for each industry, which is really worthwhile. We don't have time to go through that here, but let's do a little lightning round here. Um, some of the questions that you asked that I'd love to get your opinion on, of which of course there are no you know, right answers, but we can maybe frame it. Um, let's start with retail. You, do you think large retail stores are going to disappear? Well, the f first thing I say is that disruption is never total. You know, there are still bookstores, there are still newspapers, there are still vinyl records. But mainframe saving IBM. <laughs> indeed, <laughs> indeed. But but 
real disruption means that the center of gravity is just totally moved on. Mm -hmm. And when you look at retail from that point of view, absolutely. And will large ones totally disappear? No, but you know, Walmart is teetering. If you go into a you know, Best Buy, a company that's strong here locally, you go into there, there's hardly anybody in there. A and so those stores are in tremendous trouble. Uh, the grocery stores, the clothing stores, they'll have probably a, a, a better future, but by and large, they will shrink, and, and the nature of malls will change quite substantially going forward. People are going to have to find other uses for those spaces, and that's actually going on right now. You know, it's funny. It is, and, and certainly some of the, the more remote malls, you find that they're, you know, waning, um, but then some of the the higher end malls, they seem you can't find a parking space. What, what, what's your sense of that? That's the, that's still inevitable, or it's because it's more clothing or maybe jewelry. I, I mean, there's some parts of America that have a lot of money, and therefore <laughs> they they fill up malls. But it, I, I think if you look at what's going on in malls, though, they're becoming more like indoor cities, full of restaurants and mm. health clubs and movie it's theaters, experience. and mm. sometimes even college courses and you know healthcare. Uh, centers, daycare centers, uh, air conditioning, you know, they think of them as an, an indoor environment where you might have the traditional anchor stores, but they're less necessary over time, qu quite a bit less necessary. You mentioned colleges, uh, uh, college uh, uh, courses, uh, education is something we haven't talked about, which is, again, ripe for, for disruption. Machines, will they make better diagnoses than, than doctors? Yeah, and, you know, you see this already in uh, image process. So anything that has to do with an image, an x-rays, mammograms, cancers, uh, any of the tissues, the machine learning progress there has been tremendous. And to the point where schools now should be seriously thinking about how many radiologists do they really want to train because those people are not going to be needed as much. However, they're still... Uh, you know, part of the system, they approve things, but the work itself is increasingly done by machines. And it means increasingly that it's not just done by a machine, it's done by one machine somewhere else, rather than every hospital setting up its own operations to do this stuff. And, you know, health care costs are crazy high in every country in the world, uh, especially here in, in America. But if you're ever going to crack those costs, you have to get some sort of scale and these machine learning based mm. systems are the way to do it. And, and so it is to me not just a question of should this happen, it, it's a, this is sort of what needs to happen. It's really the, the only sort of economic path that, that might work. Well, you may make the point that uh, healthcare in particular is really ripe for, for disruption of, of all industries. The next one's really interesting uh, to me. You talked about uh, blockchain being sort of aimed at, at, at banking and financial services and a, as an industry that has not really yet been disrupted, but do you think banks will lose control of the, the payment system? You know, banks have been incredibly good at keeping control through cash and paper checks and credit cards and ATM machines. They, they've been really good mm -hmm. about that and, and perhaps they will ride this one too, but you, you can see, you know, Countries are, are clearly going to, they're getting rid of cash, they're going to digital currencies, there's a need for, you know, to be able to send money around as simply as we, as we send emails around, and, and the banking industry is not really supporting those changes right now. So they are at risk, but they are very good at co-opting stuff, and, and I wouldn't count them out. And the government really wants to get rid of paper money, I mean, yeah. they made that point, and the government and the financial services work together. And, and they and always work together, they have a lot to lose. Yeah, and so. you know, way back when, Satoshi Nakamoto, whoever he or she <laughs> is, or, or it, they, whatever it is, said that Bitcoin would either be very, very big or would vanish altogether. A and I think that statement is still true, and we're still in that middle world. But if Bitcoin vanishes, something doing a similar thing will emerge because the concepts and the capabilities there are, are, are really what people want. This is, yeah. I mean, the killer app for blockchain is for right now, it's money. So yeah. <laughs> it's speculation. Yeah. I mean, it's, <laughs> no one uses it to buy anything. <laughs> I mean, that was you know, the original Bitcoin vision of using it to go buy pizzas and coffees. Is, yeah. is, it's, become, it's, it's become gold. It's digital gold. Right. I mean, that's all it is. It's, it's the value store. That, it's digital gold that is very good on the dark web. And if anybody <laughs> does transact in Bitcoin, they immediately convert it to fiat <laughs> currency. <laughs> Perhaps someday we'll learn that the Russians actually built Bitcoin. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> that's Putin's in control. And it was, yeah, stranger things Possible. happen. Hey, why, why they, keep they it anonymous? They are the masters yeah. of the dark web. <laughs> yeah. Could be Russians, could be a, could be a woman. Right? Could, 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 could nobody has things. any idea. Um, Robotic process automation is really interesting. You know, software robots, robots. Um, do you see that reversing sort of offshoring, offshore manufacturing and other services? N not, n not really. I, I think in general, people look at robotics, they looked at 3D printing and said, maybe we can bring all this stuff back home. But mm. the reality is that, that China uses robots in 3D printing too, uh, and they're really good at it. If anything's going to bring manufacturing back home, it's, it's much more political pressures, tr trade strategies, and all the stuff you see going on mm. right now. Because we do have crazy imbalances in the world that probably will have to change. and as. Ben Stein, the economist, once said, well, if, if something can't go on forever, it, it won't. A and, and I think there will be some reversals, but I think they'll be less about technology than they will be about political pressures and, and trade agreements and those sort of changes. Because the technology is widely accessible. So, yeah. so uh, how far do you think we can take machine in intelligence, and how far should we take machine intelligence? Well, I, I make a, a distinction right now that I think Machine intelligence for particular purposes is tremendous. If you want to recognize faces or eventually talk to something or have it read something or recognize an activity or, or read images and do all the things it's doing, it's very good. When they talk about a more generalized machine intelligence, it's actually really poor. Uh, but to me, that's not that important. And, and one way we look at machines, it's almost like the app industry. There'll be an app for that. There'll be a machine learning Mm -hmm. algorithm for almost every little thing that, that we do that involves data. And those areas will, will thrive you know, mightily. Uh, and the, sort of the bottom line we try to look at that is, you know, who's got the best data? You know, Facebook is good at facial recognition because it's got the faces. And Google's good at language translation because it has the books and language pairs that are better than anybody else. And, and so if you follow the data, uh, and wherever there's good data, machine learning will, will thrive. And where there isn't, it won't. The book is called Seeing Digital, a visual guide to the industries, organizations, and careers of the 2020s. And part of that visual guide is every single page actually has a graphic. So really a new concept that you've... Yeah, and then thanks for bringing that in. Uh, the reason the book is called Seeing Digital is that the book itself is a visual book, that every page has a graphic, an image, a picture, uh, and it explains itself below. And, and just in our own work with our own clients, people tell us it's just a more impactful way of reading. Uh, so it's a different format. Uh, it, it's great in the ebook format because you can use colors, you can do lots of things that the printed world doesn't do so well. Uh, and so we try to take advantage of modern technologies to bring a, a different sort of book to the market. That's great. So Google it, you'll find it easily. Uh, Dave, again, congratulations. Thanks so much for coming on theCUBE. Thank you, pleasure. All right, and thank you for watching, everybody. We'll see you next time. <laughs>